guess these are their introductions, right? I think everybody knows me here, right? Ted Lawrence, head of the Cancer Center. And um, I'm going to talk about the state of the Cancer Center today. I do want to make a small apology uh, to the six of you in the audience who came to my town halls. <laughs> Laugh. <laughs> right? And so a few of those slides will look like uh, uh, some of those slides that, as I said, the six of you have seen. I don't know if there are any Car Talk fans here, but <clears throat> they often will talk about our listener. And so uh, that's the way I felt at the town halls. I'm working at doing them at different times. Maybe it's the time of day. Maybe it's the food. This is still, uh, the town halls are still a work in progress. So today I want to try to cover quite a few topics. This is, I've now been in this position for one year. And so uh, we're beginning strategic planning. So I thought I should talk a little bit about mission, vision, and aspirations. You'll uh, hear a lot about this uh, as the year goes on. Uh, about clinical care and the clinical care reorganization that's going on. Uh, a little bit about research, or quite a bit about research, and the uh, kind of ways that we're trying to stimulate that. Just a touch about education, because our education program is really just getting going uh, within, in its new form with a new associate director for clinical, uh, for uh, education and training. Uh, a little, quite a bit about the Cancer Center uh, support grant, because that's going to be one of at least my main focuses and many of your main focuses as we run up to the submission in May of 2017. Uh, a bit about community outreach, a little bit about how I've been trying to communicate with you, uh, how the Cancer Center has supported a number of investigators here, and then I hope we have some time for discussion uh, and questions at the end uh, because a lot's going on. <clears throat> so I'd like to begin with some questions that I hope all of you, at least all of you are beginning to ask, is what drives us as a Cancer Center? What do we want to stand for? And what are our values? So I think every organization has to have a mission. I'm sometimes a little cynical about missions. I don't know if any of you have been to the Dilbert website. There's a generic mission statement generator that you can go to if you need to. But I still think it's, we still should have some sort of a mission, which in our case should be to serve our patient community and be a national leader in conquering cancer through innovation and collaboration. And our mission is consistent with the mission of the School of Medicine and the health system which is to create the future of healthcare through discovery and become the national leader in healthcare, healthcare reform, biomedical innovation, and education. This is what gets me up in the morning, and I hope it gets some of you up in the morning as well. The vision of our cancer center should be to build upon our naturally interactive and collaborative transdisciplinary research environment to advance the way we prevent, diagnose, and treat cancer through high impact laboratory, clinical, and population science discoveries. I think it's important to, to always think about our wide ranging mission and uh, not just think about our own area of research, but think broadly about all the kinds of research uh, that goes on here uh, as, we, as we try to make discoveries that we hope will impact on the care of patients. So we aspire to be a discovery agent in all aspects of the cancer research spectrum. Spectrum, Not spectrum, but spectrum. That's, uh, those of you who know the health care consolidation that's going on here, right, there's a, forget it. Uh, uh, we will be known nationally for bringing laboratory discoveries to the clinic, and I think we are known nationally in some areas. I'd like to be known in more areas. We want to be a leader in training the next generation of academic cancer researchers scholars and clinicians, and we need to help develop a statewide cancer outreach and services and research. So we need to do all of these things uh, to be a successful uh, cancer center and even more broadly than that, a cancer program. What are our core values? We want to innovate, we want to collaborate, and we need to advocate for our patients and for research and for education. So where do we stand compared to our peer NCI cancer centers? And again, this is the beginning of, uh, of uh, strategic planning that we're going to be doing. So uh, I'm not completely in favor of SWOT analyses. Uh, some people have advocated that you should do a TOES analysis, that is threats, opportunities, weaknesses, and strengths, because sometimes SWOT analyses can look backwards. But I still think it's important for us to spend some time thinking about this. 
So we do have some major strengths here in our cancer center. We do have a national reputation and almost all of it is good. We have a collaborative environment. We have depth and breadth of our research base. We have a track record in peer reviewed funding. Uh, when we had our external advisory board meeting here in September, they were very impressed that in a, in a difficult environment, we've still continued to do reasonably well in funding our work. We have very strong cores and we have excellence in training. <clears throat> but we have some weaknesses that we need to face. We have a, a lack of collaborative grants in some areas. And one of the most very important things in oncology uh, require a, a team to do them. It, it's still great to have that R01 funded laboratory with a PI and a postdoc and a graduate student, but it's hard to make the big discovery uh, with just that, that sort of, uh, of, a, of a group. We've had a significant decline in therapeutic accruals. I'll talk quite a bit about this. I think this is probably our greatest uh, weakness, our greatest Achilles heel as we go toward the core grant. And so it's been the area that I have focused, I'd say probably the most in, in the year I've been center director. We have a limited number of PIs in the clinical uh, area uh, of, of, who are experienced. We have significant inefficiencies in our clinical trial processes. And we've had a limited focus on catchment through research and outreach. So uh, I won't talk a lot about that today. It's a focus of the Cancer Center Core Grant, but it's important that we not only try to do great things that will affect the world, but we have a, a catchment area, that is where we receive our patients from. And we should be thinking about how do we help the patients who are coming to us, not just the patients in the rest of the United States or the world. We have some important threats. We have increasing local and statewide competition, and we have increasing clinical pressure on our faculty. <clears throat> we ask our faculty to do, I'll say, more and more with less and less, and that's something that uh, I hope to at least partially reverse that trend in the kinds of support we can give people uh, through the cancer program. And we have some important opportunities. We have new institutional and cancer center leadership and that provides new opportunities to engage in institutional initiatives. And we have partnerships with internal groups uh, with shared interests. So uh, we have uh, Mishur, uh, the um, CTSA grant, uh, uh, George Mishur and I have talked about ways we can collaborate. And there are multiple areas with the uh, IHPI. We have a lot of groups here where we can launch uh, important collaborations and we all want the same thing. So I think we have a lot of opportunities uh, to build on. So I'm going to stop there with the <clears throat> strategic planning and, and, and move on to some other areas. But we'll be coming back to this multiple times during the year. This is not the last time uh, you'll hear about how we, move to, how we need to move forward in those areas. So I did want to show you our uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, org chart because there are some new names and there are some names uh, that need to be filled. I hope everybody uh, by now knows uh, Scott Wood. Actually, Scott, would you mind, up, mind staying up and just waving to everybody for a second? Scott is my chief administrative officer uh, who's been part of everything we've done. Uh, a lot of these names, uh, Eric Fearon, you should know well. Alon Weiser's been in his position for quite a while. Uh, Sam Silver has been in the position for close to a year. Sam, you're here in case, I mean, everybody knows Sam. But Sam, you want to just stand up and wave to people? I thought I saw you coming in here. Thanks. Yeah. Everybody knows, I think everybody knows you. Uh, uh, Beth Lawler, who I know can't be here today, is our Associate Director for Education and Training. I'll, may, may, I'll, because she's one of the newer members, I'm gonna say a few things about her. We are recruiting, oh, I skipped this uh, spot here. We are recruiting for a uh, clinical deputy director, a, a deputy director for clinical services, who will be over all of our clinical services within the center, uh, that was Kathy Cooney's a position that she had in addition to being a head of the Division of Hematology and Oncology. And uh, uh, we've, um, uh, uh, Dr. Reddy, Pav uh, I'm sure everybody knows, Pavan Reddy is the uh, interim director of Hemonc. And when I mentioned to him that uh, Kathy had been the deputy director for clinical services, Pavan, are you here? I don't, I'm not sure I see you. Uh, well, so I can say this too, but it's being recorded. He can see this. Puffin's eyes got kind of big and he said, no, that's not, more or less, that's not my skill set. He actually said something different from that. But that, that, conveys, <laughs> <laughs> that conveys the sense of what he said. And so uh, I think it's important that we recruit a new person to that position. It's a very, very important position, uh, especially as we develop 
uh, a full uh, uh, cadre of people who, who will serve uh, with that position. So we have Alon Weiser, whom I mentioned, who works within the cancer, the cancer Center ACU. There's another blank here for inpatient. We're supposed to have a position that's coordinating inpatient services with everything else that happens in the outpatient uh, group, which is not, uh, I think people overall get this done, but it could be done better. I mentioned Sam already. <clears throat> uh, then uh, we, we are recruiting for an associate director for clinical research. I think this is potentially an important position that we can use to bring in a senior clinical researcher from outside. We have Moshe Talpaz, again, who's been in his position for quite a while. And then an, a relatively new person, I'm skipping Eric again, in his role as associate director for basic research. We have a relatively new person I'll talk about in a few moments. Uh, Brahmar Mukherjee, Associate uh, Director for Population Sciences, and then Jeremy Taylor, who's been our Associate Director for Biostatistics and Bioinformatics. Uh, for the Biostatistics part for how many years, Jeremy? 18 years. And the Bioinformatics part for 18 days? And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few moments. So I want to talk about our clinical mission and begin with the uh, Cancer Center ACU, just to give you a sense of the scope of just the Cancer Center ACU. And I'll just, it's important to recognize the Cancer Center ACU is just one component of our cancer program. You know, there's a lot of surgical oncology, otolaryngology, just go all the way down the line of multiple other areas that do some work within the Cancer Center ACU, <clears throat> but a significant amount of work outside the Cancer Center ACU. So this is just the Cancer Center ACU. We have good data, 192,000 RVUs, over 100,000 clinic visits, 48,000 infusion visits, 478 full-time staff, 169 physicians who work there. And the space, especially the infusion space, is inadequate. And so this is a big area uh, that I need to work on uh, with leadership this year. And as, uh, I, as I summarize at the end, I'll say it now and I'll say it again, uh, I'm uh, engaged in, in major negotiations with leadership because this is we will never really be able to fulfill our mission and grow if we can't Im improve our space, especially our infusion space. Uh, this is, um, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, when you first glance at it, it's a complicated diagram, but uh, this is a diagram that we're really trying to use to capture the whole, not only the details of our cancer program, but the spirit of our cancer program. And the spirit is that we're in a house, and <clears throat> we're all in that same house, and we're all together. And the house has, has a, a foundation, and the foundation are the different uh, disease groups. And these are groups of people who work together, who practice together, and who will do clinical research together, although the, this house is illustrating many of the clinical care. But a key feature in all of this is the clinical care needs to be carried out in a way that will facilitate research to occur. And I'll just give one specific detail about that. There's going to be an administrative differential for each of the people heading these different disease groups. And the administrative differential is split between the cancer center ACU, that is the more clinical side, with the cancer uh, research program, the research side, with the goal that the heads of each of, these research, each of these disease groups has that dual mission of making people practice, helping people practice, as a group, but also helping them to facilitate a clinical research. Then these are grouped together in four different sub-ACUs. Uh, the, the two, uh, the blue team and gold team, both on solid tumors, <clears throat> the maize team in liquid tumors, and then another ACU uh, based on uh, the issues of infusion. And then, of course, there's a lot of cancer care, as I mentioned earlier, that goes on outside of uh, the actual uh, uh, physical building in the ACU. So I think I am very much in favor of this structure. Our goal is to practice together, to work together in disease groups, but then also to use this to uh, improve our clinical research. And I'll be talking more about that in a few moments when we discuss how the Cancer Center Core Grant uh, is going to be organized. Because again, we want to have, we want to stimulate clinical research and, and uh, organize people so they can try to, to realize all of our missions. Now I have to talk about accruals to interventional trials. And this is, a, uh, this is an area that, as I said, I've, we've worked hard on. And I, I wanna, I, I'm being optimistic, and I think the data suggests we're beginning to turn things around. And so 
Uh, what I'm showing you here is beginning in 2010, when the last core grant was submitted. Uh, all I, I, yeah, so this says 12.6%, this says I see that shifted a bit. And this says a 10.8%, got kind of lost in the blue bars there. But so what this, rec, uh, re, what this shows on the left axis is the total number of accruals, <clears throat> pardon me, the clinical trials, and then the percentages give you the percentage of patients who were accrued to clinical trials. And what you can, uh, I think, see uh, pretty clearly is that both of those uh, have dipped uh, between 2010 and 2014. Uh, when I became, uh, 2014 is that complete year, and I became a director uh, in early 2015. So when one drops below 10%, first of all, it's just not a good thing for our cancer program. And secondly, uh, you, you uh, now go in the crosshairs of Cancer Center core grant site reviewers uh, who think that that's not the good behavior for a high quality cancer center, that, that our mission is to take great care of patients, but it's also uh, to improve the outcome of treatment, and that happens through clinical trials. Uh, and so uh, we put a lot of work into trying to improve this, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the bad news on this slide is we've slipped to 9.1% up to 2014, but the good news is I do think we're beginning to turn around and we're back close to the 10% figure uh, as of 2000, the end of 2015, and uh, I hope we continue uh, to train, to, to, to trend even better and better in this area. Uh, and obviously the goal here is not just to put patients on trials, but to do impactful studies. But I always like to think about <clears throat> Linus Pauling, a Nobel Prize winner who was, who was uh, quite sharp for most of his life until he got into vitamin C, but we won't don't have to discuss that uh, today. And he said, in order to have good ideas, you have to have a lot of ideas. And so that's the way I think about clinical research. In order to have great trials, we just, we have to put out quite a few trials. And so uh, I, I thank the people in the audience, I see many of them here, who have worked to accrue patients to studies, and, and we're gonna do better and better on this. I do have to give you one more nasty fact before I leave this slide, and I'll try not to dwell too much on the nasty anymore. Uh, we recently received uh, information from an NCCN poll uh, in which they looked at 22 institutions who are NCCN institutions and the fraction of patients they accrued to clinical trials. And we are third from the bottom of the 22. That is not where the leaders and the best need to be. So I, I guess I've beaten on that point, but. It's almost hard for me not to beat on that point uh, sufficiently. Now I want to pause for a second and look institutionally because this has been viewed as an institutional problem as well and then I'll come back for a moment to the Cancer Center. So I hope some of you have heard about clinical research nodes. It applies less to our cancer program than to most of the rest of the institution because we've already had uh, a clinical trial structure. But I think it's important for you to know what's going on in the rest of the institution because also this is institutional resources are going to come into our hands because of this, uh, this initiative. And so what's shown here are three areas, the Office of Research, <clears throat> Misher, and the Service Node. Now the Service Node has been the Cancer Center, what you've thought of as the Cancer Center, including the Clinical Trials Office, uh, the PRC, uh, DSMB, all of those uh, features that we know about are all within our service node. Now, you know, the rest of the institution uh, hasn't had these things, so these, these are all going to be stood up by this clinical uh, research node effort that's going on throughout the institution. The faculty group practice, the UMMG, has put $15 million into supporting these, uh, this part for the institution. Uh, and then the dean has put $15 million into this to strengthen the IRB. So this is all really good stuff. And money is going to come to the, um, to the Cancer Center, which I'll talk about in a minute. And we have uh, been able to appoint Chris Lau, whom I'll talk more about in a minute, into the head of the service node position, which I think is, is going to, even though we have a lot of structure, this is going to put extra resources and some extra structure into our uh, clinical research that will be very, very helpful to us. Now, I, I purposely mention this because there's a node proposal information meeting today at 4 to 5 p.m. in the Dow Auditorium. So it, just, it, it, it also turns out that I am the head of the committee that's been uh, running this. It's really a, 
it's, it's a kind of a coincidence. I, frankly, I, I would not have volunteered for that position if I'd known I was going to become cancer center director. It's, it's a lot. <clears throat> but I think in the end, it turns out to, because um, this, this, this process has started you know, well over a year ago. But I think in the end, it's, I'm excited that it's turned out that way because, of course, I would never show any overt favoritism to the cancer center. I would never do that. But, <laughs> but maybe a little bit of favoritism isn't, isn't the world's, no, I'm, I'm really seriously, I think I've been able to steer this in a way that comes from our experience in the cancer program and I, I believe has helped uh, the whole initiative. But there have been a lot of people on this committee uh, and particularly uh, Terry Grieve, who's, who supported it, and George Mishur, and Anna Locke, and others. But if you really want to know more about nodes, uh, come to this meeting today at the Dow. So the reason I'm talking about this is because we have a new oncology node director. So I don't know, Chris, I'm, I'm asking people I see in the audience to wave to people. So can you go wave to people? OK, Chris Lau is our new node director. At least I don't have a spotlight to shine on you or anything, just a little wave. So Chris has accepted this position, and I have some facts about him here. <clears throat> so again, the goal of the node structure is to add to our already existing components, but also it's going to pull in pre- and post-award, which I think should make us much more efficient across the whole cancer program in, in how we budget and how we handle our awards uh, afterwards. Uh, part of the clinical, uh, part of this uh, <coughs> system is going to be uh, to implement a clinical trial management system. And, and Matt, I saw Matt in this area. Matt will help to, and Chris will help to pull all those things together. But that's not going to occur until after the core grant goes in. So no panic, right? We're going to stick with what we have. But I think in the end, the cl new clinical trial management system uh, that we will have, the Encore Forte system, will really, will in the end be a great benefit to us. And, and we will be receiving, do I have the next slide? Yes. We'll be receiving $1.25 million a year for three years, assuming we handle it right, to improve our clinical trial activity through this effort. And we uh, are getting the most money of any node because we have the greatest number of clinical trials of, of any node. I don't know if everybody knows this, about half the clinical trials in the School of Medicine are, are, are our trials. So, uh, and that is why we're getting the, 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 the most money. So what have we done to increase uh, accruals? Well, we've increased investigator-initiated funding. I'll show you lots of examples of that toward the end of the talk. We've recently approved a protocol editor. I have Erin's uh, email address there. And she will help in a number of ways. In particular, if you've had a protocol come from the PRC, and, and she will help uh, track change what the PRC has asked you for. And then as an investigator, instead of having that sit on your desk for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and then having you, having you blame us for a long turnaround time when it sat on your desk for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, you can just hit, you, I mean, you can look at them and you can hit accept track changes and your protocol can turn around and go back in. And Matt, there may be other things that we'll, Aaron will work on, but she'll help us to prepare protocols with better first time quality and better able to, uh, uh, to correct uh, things that need to be corrected. And if her time is completely used up by you fine people, we will hire another protocol editor until you have used them all up in submitting great, fabulous clinical trials. Uh, we've been hiring coordinators for groups that are recruiting. We've hired, how many coordinators, Scott? Five? Four or five coordinators to the different groups that are accruing so that they can uh, be more efficient in their accrual. Uh, we're trying hard to recruit clinical trialists. We have offers uh, now out to uh, three people, a fourth potentially on the way, and hopefully we can land some of these people uh, to stimulate our clinical trials. <clears throat> of course, everybody knows that, everybody knows, right, that the cancer center director doesn't appoint anybody, that all appointments are through departments. But as a center director, I've been trying hard to help uh, add to startup packages, uh, in some cases, supplement effort for the first few years so that people have more time, you know, rather than being put in the clinic so much. If the, as clinical researchers, the cancer center is supplementing their effort for the first few years to get them established so that they don't have that, that much, that, that intensive clinical uh, uh, need to develop to, to uh, produce RVUs during their first few years. And then we're working to improve many components of our clinical trial pathway, uh, disease, develop disease group capabilities, and also we absolutely need to reduce our time to activation. And those of you who uh, uh, have at least a six day or so um, uh, lifetime on your 
emails that you, that you uh, delete. This email, even if you deleted it from March 17th, should still be there. And you can read about some new initiatives uh, that Scott uh, Schutze and, and uh, Matt uh, have outlined to uh, reduce our time for activation. I know Chris wakes up every morning in the shower. It's all he thinks about is decreasing our time to activation. And we will put our full authority and force behind him to, to help organize that. So I want to now to turn <clears throat> to research in general, what's our current uh, research effort, and how can the CCSG, the Cancer Center Core Grant, and the Cancer Center in general uh, try to, to aid it, try to add value to it. Well, here are NCI grants uh, since uh, 2011 when the Core Grant went in. Now, a couple of things happened between 2011 and 2013, the SWAG grant and the, remember ARA grants, those lovely days when they just, they just couldn't force money into our research programs fast enough. I had a lovely ARA supplement that helped so much. Anyway, that's, of course, all gone. And, so, uh, and then we, we uh, dropped a bit and uh, now have come back up as of 2016 in our NCI grants. And the reason I wanted to show this slide was, first of all, to show you that we've come back up. But secondly, look at 168 grants versus 191 grants, but, uh, but that's the same amount of money. And so... Uh, this is a problem that the University of Michigan has, and I don't know if it's because we're, we're sort of low-key Midwesterners, and we just don't ask for enough money. So our average grant size is less than the average grant size of most other institutions. So you do great work. Ask for the money you need to do your work. And that was the main reason I, I wanted to show this slide, that we're rebounding in NCI grants and... and don't, just because a, uh, there's a nice round number for a modular grant doesn't mean you need to be stuck with a modular grant, so go for it. Our total grant funding has also rebounded. These numbers are quite a bit larger than the numbers you saw in the prior panel because um, these include uh, annual directs, uh, an annual, uh, annual total, annual direct costs, and also uh, this is all of our funding, uh, peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed. So we're definitely a rebounding during this last year. So this is all good news. I want to just talk about three areas of research that to me encompass the concept of precision medicine, uh, which I think is a very broad concept, not just my OncoSeq, which I'm very proud of being from the University of Michigan, but, but we need to think broadly about what precision medicine is. We need to think about it for at least two reasons. First of all, I think it's the right thing that is adapting or using your treatment that's right for that individual patient and not just for the average patient. And secondly, President Obama did say that $70 million was going to come to cancer for precision medicine. So if you can get that term precision medicine firmly in your lexicon, it would really be a practice that first thing in the morning. It would be a good thing uh, to, to work into your grants. So I did want to spend a couple of minutes on three examples of, of what I think of as precision medicine. Uh, and I just can't cover the breadth of the of the incredible science that goes on here. So we'll just have to, uh, to start with this one, which is my OncoSeq, the Michigan Oncology Sequencing Program, which I think everybody has heard of. And what I wanted to highlight is a really cool study uh, uh, led by Rajan Modi in pediatrics uh, and his collaborators and Arul Chanayan's collaborators on the pediatric my OncoSeq clinical pilot. And many of you may know about this, but I thought it was worth bringing up again, that the concept here was to prospectively use this approach to try to see does uh, whole gene, well, does, does genome sequencing, some of it's whole, some of it's exome sequencing, does it really affect what might be beneficial to a patient? So he began, they, be, they began this with 102 patients. I'm not going to read through every box of this. You can see some of them had uh, patients with, uh, had uh, you know, agreed to participate. Some had uh, tissue that was a sufficient uh, quality so they could work with it. And there's a spectrum of solid tumors. And, and, and hematologic malignancies, uh, which you can see in the pie chart and how they all break down. But the, the real uh, meat of this study, which was published in JAMA and got a lot of national attention, was to begin with the sequencing, but what, what could be called actionable? Actionable is a funny word, I, I agree. And one person's actionable is not another person's actionable. But at least, I think, defined broadly, was there something about the sequencing that was of use, or was it just a laboratory exercise, is the way they defined it actionable. And so uh, then you can look at, at this third pie chart for what were the natures of the intervention. In some cases, it was genetic counseling. In some cases, it was potentially even 
uh, a suggestion of a change in therapy. And then again, in some situations on this pie chart, there were benefit to the patient, some there were benefit to the family. Uh, and this is, as you can tell, uh, this is the, the kinds of things that were found, uh, some of which were actionable and some of which is, were non-actionable. But I think that, that this approach, this is one aspect of precision medicine, uh, is it really an area that, that we, when I say we, I mean rule and his colleagues and Scott Tomlins now and others working with them, we really invented. And, and now we are, now I, you know, Dana Farber, uh, I hear it, and uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and, and God help me, Cancer Treatment Centers of America. You know, don't you get kind of slightly sick to your stomach every time you hear that? So this needs to be part of our everyday life. Uh, and, and one of my goals for this year is to work with across a spectrum of people to, to make this part of our everyday life. Now, I want to uh, please forgive me for featuring some of the work that goes on in my own department on what I consider another uh, facet of precision medicine, which is to adapt treatment to the individual patient response. Now, the overall concept of this approach is that one intensively studies patients and then midway through treatment intensively studies them again. And the underlying hypothesis, and every time I describe this, it, it seems too simple to be, to be funded by a large program project grant. But the underlying hypothesis is the best way to know if a tumor is responding is, is the tumor responding? And the best way to know if the normal tissue is being injured is, is the normal tissue being injured? <clears throat> and so, uh, but, but it's a new concept that we, I think, are applying in what I hope you think is a reasonably intelligent way. Now, the upper part of the slide is, is, uh, is, um, makes it complicated enough so it would be appealing to the NCI. You know, what I said was like way too simple to be appealing to the NCI. But what's shown on the top part of the slide is that you can't, if you're going to look over time between a pretreatment and a mid-treatment, uh, in this case uh, an MRI, looking at MRI perfusion, you can't just match lot. My jokes were no good. My <laughs> I'll try to improve my material. <laughs> you, you can't just go voxel to voxel because the, the re, just small registration issues would, would, would ruin all of your data, would, would throw things into chaos. And so James Balter, who's sitting here in the front, in UA Cal, yeah, James, this is stuff you worked on. Huh? It's project three, right, of the program project grant, um, have figured out ways of, of organizing the image so that it's something that we can aim a beam at. And it's something that, uh, that it will, it will, is much uh, more robust against voxel to voxel uh, 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 registration. And they, they can calculate the probability of different voxels being in different classes and form sub-volumes based on those probabilities. But the bottom line really for, for you at this, I think, is, is down here, which is that this is pretreatment, this is mid-treatment. These red areas signify a lot of perfusion uh, in a tumor. And, and the fact that that's getting smaller means the tumor is responding, and one can focus the radiation just on those areas that aren't responding. Unfortunately, in this patient, you can see the red areas have gotten larger. So one can intensify treatment on the areas that are not responding. And the flip side is one can do this for the normal tissues looking at injury. So I consider this another form of precision medicine because, it, because it's going from a population to the individual patient and because we have a better chance of being funded by President Obama. Now, I think there's another, I consider this last uh, example, another form of precision medicine, which is some beautiful work that's uh, being carried out by Sarah Hawley and Stephen Katz, uh, supported by the, uh, the R01 and published in JAMA uh, Surgery that's uh, shown there on the bottom of the slide. And this is on social and clinical determinants of contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. And so this has been a great deal in the news, right? Women being diagnosed with one breast cancer and then deciding to have both their breasts removed. And the key part, uh, the key concept in this slide is here are one way that women make decisions based on genetic testing. Here's another way women make decisions based on their family history. But here's a third way they make decisions based on whether they are worried. That is, that we have, that we have a chance to communicate with women and give them the appropriate information that they need so they can make the best decisions not just based on nonspecific worry or what a neighbor told them, but, but on good data. And how do we individually craft our communications? I'm looking at Larry on in the audience, and this is, right, Larry, isn't this what you live for? How do you, well, in, in your professional life. 
But you know, how do you um, craft the right message to that patient? Because a message that works for one patient may not work for another patient. And so I consider this another form of precision medicine, of individually crafting uh, the message uh, to the patient so that, in this case, she understands and, and makes her decision based on data and not just based on fear. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Brahma Mukherjee as a way that the cancer program, is, the cancer center is supporting uh, the research we do here. Uh, the, we, the cancer center has had an associate director position for population scientists for four years. Steve Gruber, those of you who remember him, was the last person in that position. And that position was open for four years. And I'm just delighted that we recruited Brahmar uh, to this position. Uh, I've given her, you her background here. She's interested in molecular uh, epi and statistics. Uh, I, one more time, I'll thank Jeremy Taylor and Eric, and, and, uh, Eric Fearon, who led the committee, uh, to find her and uh, make recommendations. And they're now in the process of developing a strategic plan. The Cancer Center has uh, allocated a million dollars to help her work with different departments in the School of Public Health or the School of Nursing or the Medical School or at whatever appropriate school to help recruit uh, additional researchers into this area. Uh, we've also allocated $250,000 to the two population science programs over the next three years to help them develop a strategic plan and, and really begin to work within their programs better and between their programs better. Because these programs, are, they've languished a little bit in the four years uh, that, that uh, we've not had a leader. Uh, associate director for this area. So I'm very excited about her recruitment and what she's already started. Uh, we've started a tumor response analysis core. I didn't see V. Sahai come in or Isaac Francis, but V and Isaac uh, came to us a while ago and said, in order to be a professional clinical research group, you can't just have uh, um, the investigators uh, with um, going to the light box and, and putting a little cursor on it and and measuring their own tumors in different ways at different times. And so uh, they have started a really fantastic uh, tumor response analysis core, TRAC, <clears throat> which offers objective quantitative assessment of tumor size. It's a line item on industry trials. Industry is willing to pay for this because they realize they're going to get high quality data. And C-TRAC will cover it for investigator initiated trials. We've committed $360,000 over three years. We already have 12 users and we want to see this core build. We've been trying to improve medical and bioinformatics. All the people I've talked to in our surveys have suggested that we have a real weakness at Michigan in this area. We had two uh, consultants come in recently, uh, listed here, who interviewed many of you here, and we're awaiting their final report. In the meantime, with respect to medical bioinformatics, we started discussions with CancerLink, uh, the ASCO product. I don't know how many of you are here uh, to hear Alan Lichter who's the CEO of ASCO, talk about this product and how it will help us use our own data to improve our care and also to compare our outcomes with those of other institutions. In addition, Jeremy Taylor proposed to us that we could uh, expand the biostatistics score to include bioinformatics. There is a medical school bioinformatics score, but it's really not focused on cancer. It's much more generic, and we thought we needed to have something that was much more cancer-specific. So the Cancer Center is already supporting partial effort for three bioinformatics faculty to aid Cancer Center members who need this help. And we are working now on additional bioinformatics recruitment. Uh, in fact, in my other hat as chair of radiation oncology, I am trying to recruit somebody into our department to do bioinformatics. We have some needs, but frankly, my main goal in this is that I expected with the recruit I have in mind to allocate some of his time to this core so we can continue to strengthen the core. And at the last uh, chair's dinner, I discussed with the chairs how each, and, and many of the chairs want to recruit people into bioinformatics who have some cancer expertise. So I'm hoping this is a way of working in collaboration with computational medicine and biology and individual departments and the cancer center to continue to, to build the core by getting partial effort uh, from, uh, from recruits. Uh, Eric Fearon and I and, and many people have been, have been working on restructuring the Cancer Center Support Grant. We have 13 programs. A cancer center of our size usually has six to eight programs. We've gone through a rigorous process. I'm not listing all the things we've gone through with external consultants and our external advisory board to consolidate from 13 to between seven and nine programs, most likely in the range of seven. Eric and I are going to present this to our program leaders this week 
and then we're then going to distribute this to the rest of the cancer center members. Now, the key, a couple of key issues here, people are collaborating, we'll still collaborate. We don't want to disrupt anything that's working. This is simply how do we sell our science in the best possible way in a core grant, but it's also how can we bring people together who may have opportunities to collaborate, but those opportunities could be made stronger by having them in the same program. So the next steps are that each Cancer Center Support Grant program is going to actually receive money to support projects that are consistent with the Cancer Center and program strategy, like building databases, like new seed grants, like symposia. We're going to have disease research teams. That is, each group will still, uh, the thoracic working together, breast is working together. They're still going to work together. And not only will they work together, they'll also get some support. So I don't know if people knew this in the past. We weren't able to actually put any money into the program leader's hands and the program's hands to do, to do anything, nor were we able to put money into disease groups, disease research teams, to do anything. So there's going to be 800,000 new dollars per year to stimulate uh, clinical research across this program and within the in individual uh, disease groups, disease research teams. And these disease research teams will collaborate with the disease groups so that the patients who are coming in are matched to the clinical trialists. And I think this should, should really uh, stimulate clinical research uh, and improve our clinical care. Now I want to talk about cancer center membership because this can be, this should not be a sore point, but could be a sore point. So my reading of the Cancer Center Support Grant guidelines from the NCI requires that CCSG members be either the PI of a cancer relevant grant, the PI of a clinical trial, a new investigator, usually interpreted in the first three years of being here, or with a track record, but in between grants, year, two years, something like that. Or also a team scientist. There are some people you know, uh, I'll just pick biostatistics, who have five or 10% effort on five grants. And that grant would never be doable without that person, even though that person may not be the PI. And so these, uh, I, I'll defend these people being CCSG members. And others will just be Ceased Cancer Center members. Okay, repeat after me. The Cancer Center Core Grant is a grant, okay? It's a grant. And so what this means is everybody who's just, who, who is quote unquote just a member, we love you, we'll hug you, I'll sing to you, you'll be part of our program, you'll be able to do everything you want to do. It's just that for the purposes of submitting this grant, we want to optimize our chances of not having someone pick out individual people. And I, I, prom I promise you, I've been there. There's a certain kind of person who, who um, maybe can't understand the science, but they can see, they can read through the list and say, this person doesn't have a grant. And I don't want to give those people anything to feast on. Okay? Can everyone nod for me on this one? I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I love all of you. <laughs> I want to talk for a minute about education. And this is, um, I want to talk about Beth Lawler, who, as I said, I know can't be here today. Um, she has an interesting background listed here. And she is, most importantly, the head of our cancer biology, T32, most importantly in this context. So uh, this is a new position that we've created uh, in the last year. And the goal of the Associate Director for Education and Training is to bring together graduate students, residents, and fellows in cancer to develop educational opportunities. So we all want to stimulate translational research. We want the laboratory people to work with the clinical people. What better way of doing that than to do that right when they're trainees, right when they're grad students, right when they're residents or fellows. And so Beth already has some really exciting ideas about how to create a, kind of a core curriculum. I hope that didn't have bad terminology, but create a core, a core curriculum that will be shared between the clinicians and the biologists and the health services researchers, and all the people who are in fellowship programs. To, to try to bring them together at the earliest stages. And we've uh, committed $750,000 to this, to hire additional people into the T32, and to create additional educational opportunities, uh, symposia, to bring people together. I want to speak for just a couple of minutes about our community outreach program. And our community outreach people are in the back row. There they are. So wave to everybody, right? Martha, Madeline, Patricia, right? And so uh, this is a wonderful effort in community outreach. The focus of their work is cancer prevention, education, and behavior change with lay public audiences. So of all the groups we work with, this is the one group that does almost nothing right in this building, right? Everything you do almost is outside. 
Uh, we want to improve community relations by building and maintaining partnerships with internal and external groups. <clears throat> Special focus on building trusting relations between UM and communities of color. And we want to enhance a diverse enrollment in our cancer clinical trials. Our, uh, the diversity in our uh, clinical trial uh, recruitment is pretty much matches what it is for the patients we see in the cancer center, which uh, does not really match very well our whole area. And this is an area that we really want to put some extra effort into. Uh, the highlights of the year I've listed here, the Breast Cancer Summit, the annual survivor, uh, Cancer Survivor Celebration, Minority Outreach. Scott reminded me that just, it was just a Saturday morning. There was a... Men's Fellowship Breakfast. Oh, the Men's Fellowship Breakfast. And we had great attendance and was a, a, a wonderful event. And uh, Scott told me as a customer of the event that it was a great event. Really enjoyed it. I've been trying to communicate. Uh, we have Cancer Connect, the first time we've had a newsletter. Uh, and then we've actually split this up into two newsletters. One, more newsy. The second, a specific message for me. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've had, I've had town halls uh, every six months. I do two of them here. I do one NCRC. There were at least a dozen of you at all those town halls. Um, <laughs> yes, you do. Absolutely. And so uh, I'm going to try different times. Uh, maybe uh, I thought about offering a, a lottery for a $10,000 grant. <laughs> what do you think? Well, think about that. But I, I really am trying to communicate. If, if something is happening that you don't understand, please talk to me. Please call me, uh, email me, uh, carrier pigeon, anything, any way that you can think of. Um, I, I, really, I know a lot of change is going on, and it's just a, 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 just a lot going on here right now. And you, you probably feel overwhelmed. I, I just have to say, I, I shouldn't talk about the MyChart emails that we get, right? I, I, wow, there's just so many of them. And so, uh, but, but mine are important. No, no that? I, I, I should have practiced my timing today. I want to spend the last few minutes on some of the people we've supported. Um, the Cancer Center has both a modest amount of development, development funds within the core grant, and then we have other funds that we use as development funds because of the hard work of Mahar and his colleagues in helping us raise money for, uh, for cancer. And uh, all of the, these people uh, shown here on the slide uh, smiling at you, and they're smiling. Why are they smiling? Because they got significant amounts of money from the Cancer Center uh, to support their uh, uh, recruitment here or their, or their work. Uh, some additional examples, I've, um, uh, Shannon Cardi uh, hasn't even started yet, but we've already committed money to her. She should be starting uh, this, this uh, summer. Uh, Coast, I'm going to point out Costas Lysiotis. Uh, Costas started just about a year ago, and uh, I was very happy to see he just won a Kimmel Scholar Award. Um, I'm, I'm actually on the Kimmel Scholar Committee. I was out of the room you know, when they assessed his, his uh, 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 package his, uh, his application, but he's doing beautiful work in metabolomics and uh, is a highly competitive grant. And actually, although not shown here, Asriam uh, Venetti also won a Kimmel Scholar Award this year. It's the first time in our history we've had two young people uh, win Kimmel Scholars Awards. Very competitive. Fewer than 10% of people uh, get this award, and the awards, the people know this, so they're self selected. So it's already a tough group to begin with. And so uh, we should be very proud of the quality of people we, we recruit, the quality of people who get funded. And I just, I just uh, call him out as an example, not to say anything, not to mean that any other pictures I'm, sh I'm showing are not also great people. And uh, I want to show one more picture of uh, Luigi Franchi. He isn't even here yet, but I saw him uh, in, his, in the space that's going to be his laboratory last week. And you should all meet him. He's got this wonderful Italian accent. He's friendly and, and uh, is a... Um, uh, Argentine, flam huh? Italian. Italian, a uh, flamenco. No, but he likes Argentine flamenco dancing, right? Where's is it? tango? Argentine tango. That's what it is. <laughs> Argentine tango dance. Thank you for the help. This was a, a group a group effort here. I know he's Italian, but it's Argentine tango dancing. So he's willing to offer lessons, and so keep that in mind. <laughs> Now, I don't, this is one of those, I don't really expect you to read what's on this slide, but I want to overwhelm you with how much we've supported 
uh, people in this institution with Cancer Center Research Grant Awards, Eric Fearon, who's really been my partner in all of this, <clears throat> um, runs a wonderful committee that rigorously assesses uh, Cancer Center research proposals. So all of these people uh, received grants, and you can see, if you, if you can read the letters, they go from health services research to basic biology to clinical research to everything. And the total of 21 projects to 21 faculty and 11 departments and divisions to a total of $770,000 that we're trying to put in to stimulate research. Uh, Moshe Talpaz runs C-Track Research Funding Awards, and I purposely significantly uh, loosened up some of the criteria for receiving C-Track awards so as to stimulate clinical research. This is an experiment. We have to see if it actually does stimulate clinical research, but I'm, I'm willing to run some experiments. So all of these people are received C-Track Research Funding Awards, and there's another uh, uh, page of these. And so, again, I'll give you just a moment to take a look at this. And again, $1.2 million awarded for 20 studies to 15 faculty and eight cancer programs. And I'm showing this to you because somehow we, we think we're poor. I don't know. We live in a, in a culture where we're constantly saying we don't have enough. And we have resources here. And we can do great things. We, and, and, uh, I, and I'm delighted to, share, to give the resources that the Cancer Center has to you so you can do these great things. So resources are not infinite, but we are not poor, and we can support things, and you should have ideas, and you should be excited, and you should ask us to support them. So I want to finish in the last couple of minutes. I want to give at least a few minutes to ask questions. So that my goals for the upcoming year in the clinical area is to roll out and adjust our new system as we discover which aspects work and which need to be improved. Okay, here's big news here. When you roll out a major change, it does not work perfectly the first time, right? So our goal is we're going to roll it out. We're going to see what works. We're going to keep that. We're going to see what doesn't work. We're going to fix that. Okay, so everybody, deep breath in. Let it out. What works, we'll keep. What doesn't work, we'll fix. We want to develop, we need to develop a stronger community presence. Uh, Dr. Rungi, I met recently with uh, Dr. Reddy and Dr. Carruthers, Dr. Spallinger and me, and he has talked to us ab about our new clinical strategy, which you've heard some about, which I was on the committee that helped us to uh, develop that. And a key aspect of that is that we need to have a better uh, relationship with the community and how we work with them and how we actually are present in the community to take care of patients. And, and we want to make precision medicine part of our everyday practice. In research, we want to recruit outstanding clinical, translational, and basic researchers in all areas. I would love to see us build an immunotherapy. It's an area where we have great science, but we haven't translated that into the clinic. I think we have super opportunities in metabolomics because we have a great diabetes group that's built a beautiful metabolomics core, and we can leverage that, put resources into that, and build a cancer metabolomics program. Likewise, we have a fabulous microbiome core that the institutions dumped about $10 million into, and we can leverage that and build on that. And uh, Pavan and I are working on a recruitment right now uh, who I, I hope we get, uh, who's very expensive, but I hope we get, uh, who um, will really take advantage of that microbiome uh, core and build that out as an important area in cancer. <coughs> Clinical trials, we must, right, Chris? We must and we will decrease activation time and increase accruals, especially for impactful and thus care initiated trials. We want to strengthen our current cores, and we will consider new cores. There are still some good ideas uh, floating around, and I hope our strategy and our retreats will, will uh, get us to, um, to start to structure that. There's been a discussion about a single cell analysis core or a circulating tumor cell core, and again, these are things we can discuss. With respect to education, we want to develop a curriculum that begins to unite our T32 programs and our clinical and laboratory trainees. We want to construct a strong CCSG submission. The key thing to me is it's not, although we want to submit a strong grant, the purpose of this is not just to submit a strong grant. I want to energize our mission. I want to use this to recharge us, to reorganize us, and, and, and uh, really improve our whole cancer thrust. And then we need to increase our service uh, to our catchment area, especially with regard to healthcare disparities. And that will be another focus of the year. So to summarize, we're undergoing a lot of change. We have outstanding people. We have strong resources. 
And although we need to focus on submitting an outstanding CCSG renewal in May, the real goal is to become a better cancer program. So thank you all for coming today. I think we have some time for questions. <laughs> questions? <clears throat> So, Jane, I, I saw your gratification to accrual and numbers. All right, it seems that the total number of patients with cancer center seats has only gone up a very small amount in the past few years. Is that capacity related mostly? Um, yes, a lot of it is capacity. It has gradually increased, but, um, the, and it is pot, partly a, cap, a capacity issue. You know, we do have community practices in Northville and in uh, Canton, and uh, we're being truly strongly urged, is that a, to use those uh, facilities as best we can. Infusion has been dramatically, dreadfully limited. Uh, we've tried, we've sort of, wrong term, metastasized throughout the institution to try to find places to infuse. Uh, I don't know if any, those of you who are uh, not medical oncologists, if you've ever been to the garden, uh, it is not a garden. <laughs> it's, it's a, <laughs> I would call it the dungeon. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't sell that to the patients. Uh, and so a, a state-of-the-art cancer center should not have space like that. And so we are, I, I think we are not fully using all of our community practice space. I think we are using the best of our ability, all the space that we have here. Uh, we're excited about Brighton opening, but that's a couple of years from now. So we, we, we need, we, we can have some band-aids. You know, we, can, we can do things in children and women's. We can do things in the space that we've, that we've tried to claim. But, but a, a long-term plan has to be to increase our, our capacity. And you saw it in the numbers, and it's particularly acute in infusion. So as I said, this is, this is something I, I've got to help uh, change with our leadership. Any other questions? I, I answered it all? <laughs> well, if there are any other questions you want to ask as a group, uh, I'll spend a couple of minutes down here if anyone wants to ask me something one-to-one. -one. Thanks again for being here. <laughs>